one of the people of Sderot. His name is Avinoam. He, he understands that something very bad is happening and he's taking his rifle and he runs towards the um, police station of Sderot. And next to this building, he hears a scream of a very young child. And then he runs to this car where, where the scream is coming from. And he hears, help me, Hatzilu in Hebrew, help me with the voice. And you can hear it because we have the video. You hear this sound of a very, very young child screaming for help. And when he gets to the car, he discovers the mother, which is shot on the front seat next to her, another man. And behind this young three years old um, girl who is screaming and next to her a baby. And she tells him, are you from Israel? Because till this moment, she saw people in uniforms, but they shot and killed her mother. And she wasn't sure because he was in uniform. Who is he? So she's saying, she's asking him, Atami Israel, three years old girl. And then he tells her, yes, darling, I'm, I'm, I'm Israeli. I'll get you out of here. And he takes her, he hugs her, and he runs together with a little baby and runs from this. And they're in the middle of fire. Everyone is shooting around. And then he runs and he saves the life of those two girls. So he, he's telling this story in front of the camera. And then at the end of the chapter, he's saying, the most crucial thing for me, and I think for many, many people who watched it. He said, I'm a citizen of Sderot. I was born here. I will never leave this place. This place is mine, and we will do everything which is needed to continue living here because we are going nowhere. And when he says this, those sentences, after you hear the story of this young girl that he saved, and you look at his, and it, at his eyes, you know that this is the truth. This is what will happen. We are going nowhere. Today is October 7th, 2024, uh, one year since Hamas's barbaric attack on southern Israel, indiscriminately killing, torturing, dismembering, and raping over 1,200 Israeli civilians and kidnapping 251 men, women, elderly, children, and babies. 101 of those hostages still remain in Hamas captivity in Gaza one year later. And my guest today is Gilad Tokatli. He's a Israeli documentary film director. Gilad, thank you very much for joining me today. Most welcome. So you are the creator and director of the documentary television series um, on the atrocities of October 7th. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Ayom Sheloni Gmal. In English, the day that never ends. And it feels almost tragically poetic to be speaking with you here on October 7th about that day that truly never ended. It's been a year, and that's really the resounding feeling amongst Israelis that that day never ended, and it still is October 7th, 2023. It's not, it's not only that. I just came back from the editing room now. We just closed chapter number five, which will be on air on this Thursday. And we ended all the procedures of the online and the mix and so on. And while working, we had those sirens and all the building had to evacuate into the shelter. And it's on October 7th, midday in Tel Aviv, and we're still in the same cycle of sirens and bombs in the middle of, this, of the city. And that's, that's really tragic. It's sort of a, a trauma that the Israeli public and Jews around the world were never really allowed to, to process or, or, and of course, even heal from, because it's a trauma that we continue to, to, uh, to experience over and over and over again. It's like a domino effect. We haven't been able to, it seems impossible to even watch or hear or try to process um, everything that's happened just on October 7th alone. Um, the flow of information is almost endless, especially in this day and age when social media and fake information is spread around the world so quickly. 
um, your task of compiling the information of the first 24 hours of October 7th into five episodes of over 100 interviews with residents of the South, soldiers, the idea of spokesperson, that's a massive undertaking of collecting the visual CCTV footage. Talk to us about what that process was like for you. For Khan 11, the, the broadcaster, the public broadcaster of Israel, it was very clear at the beginning of the way, it was like on January this year, only two months after October 7th, they sent us to this mission with a very precise idea of shooting only people who witnessed it themselves, who've been there on the ground when it happened. We don't have anyone who heard the story or has a relative. No, These no, are first-hand only... accounts. Yes, all of them. And um, they also wanted us to go throughout all the places that were were hurt by the by 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 the things that happened on October seventh, which means all the kibbutzim, all the moshavim, all the cities, all the army camps. We had to go through all of them, and all of them are part of this series. So it's not series that speaks about a specific kibbutz or about a specific place. No, we went through all the places around Gaza. And they also asked us at the beginning of the of the work to to build a very diverse profile of the people who will be interviewed during this series. They didn't want a certain type of people. No, exactly the opposite. And I think that it's very clear if you watch this series chapter after chapter that the stage is very big because we wanted a lot of faces to be presented throughout this series. Absolutely. And I, and I think that what you just said there, it, it, that's exactly it. So many people were affected by the atrocities of October 7th, uh, whether it was the party goers at the Nova Music Festival, whether it was families just waking up Saturday morning in their homes, in those kibbutzim in the south, whether it was the police officers in, in Zderot or in Ofakim that rushed to the scene to, to help and, and try to save people, whether it was the soldiers on the border, those young 18-year-old female soldiers that are now still held in captivity. It, it seems absolutely an enormous task. You actually filmed in, in 23 different locations, as you mentioned. Um, I can only imagine that must have been very difficult analyzing all this footage, the CCTV footage of terrorists invading these southern border communities. Um, when you, as a director and as an Israeli, you, you know what, what's going to happen next in those visuals. Well, I, I must say that I protected myself because I, I didn't do this search by my own eyes and hands. We have a very big crew of many, many people who went through more than 1,000 clips that we got from TikTok and Instagram and all, all possible sources. And, um, and people had to sit for hours in front of those horrible visuals and, and acts and decide which one will get into the screen on the screen of this series and and I must say now that we had we had many decisions at the beginning of the way of the way and one of them was not to be too graphic using those materials because those materials are horrible to watch and we don't want people to switch off and leave the broadcast no we want them to be with us to hear the stories and, and with this, I, I will get into the main thing, which is the witnesses who are sitting in front of the camera and speaking, like the words. And, and I'm, 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 I'm referring to an amazing project, which was on air at 1985, Shoah of Klond Landsman, who made it active almost for the first time in the history of documentary. He made a huge movie, which is nine hours long, which was made out of only of words and witnesses who were there who are telling their stories. So the main building block of his movie was um, the witnesses and the words. And I think the same thing is happening in our series, 
but there is a very big difference because we are in 2024 and we have a lot of visuals which were taken on location at that day and one of the ways to choose the people who will get into the cameras was either they have some visual background that we can use while they are speaking there are no illustrations in this series at all nothing is made out later on it's only the words and the actual shots that were taken during October 7th. What was the most memorable moment or, or interview that you experienced filming this documentary? There are so many of them, but um, let me choose one. It's uh, Dima and Katya Somorov. They live in a kibbutz and they immigrated to Israel 30 years ago. And they were inside their home in the kibbutz on October 7th morning. And Dima, long time before October, installed uh, surveillance cameras inside their home in the kibbutz. So they were hiding in two, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, mamadim? What's uh, the name? Shelters, for rocket shelters. Okay, so they were hiding in two rocket shelters within their home. And in his cell phone, he could look into those cameras that he installed all over the, his house. So he was with his wife in one shelter, and in the other shelter was his young boy. And they kept texting to each other. And they're actually looking at this, the, the surveillance cameras, and they see the Hamas terrorists going into their house, walking between the rooms. And Katya is telling us, Listen, I prayed together with all my friends globally. I texted them and I asked them, please pray for me that the terrorists will not find the door to our shelters. Not our shelter and not our boy shelter, which is, which is on the other side of the house. And she prayed and she sent the text messages all over the world. And for f more than 50 minutes, those terrorists are walking in the house and you can see them and we show it in, in the series. They are passing next to the, to the doors of the shelters and they don't even look at the doors and they don't open the doors and eventually they are all saved. And this is like a thrilling moment because think about it, that you're inside your home, inside your shelter with Nukhba terrorists walking inside your home. You see them, you hear them, you pray for your safety and and luckily it happened and no nobody saw that they're in the shelters and this is like a very it's it, you know it connects to each one who will watch this moment because we think that our home like i'm sitting in my office in my home now is my shelter well it's not my shelter when you see it in this series you have me speechless i'll be honest um it's uh, it's exactly like you said. Our, our home is our shelter un until it's not. And that day, that was such a, a clear violation, a clear clear atrocity, because it was indiscriminately attacking, targeting civilians in their homes. Um, you actually went and filmed some of those Gaza border residents returning to their destroyed homes. For the first time. Later, for yeah. the first time. Tell us a bit about that and, and tell us also how did you separate between your emotions as a human, as an Israeli, as, as somebody who you yourself experienced October 7th and your job as a director? This is like a crucial point what you just mentioned. I, I know it with my own story. My, my father was assassinated in a terror attack in Jerusalem in 2002. It happened in the middle of the city, in Jaffa Street. After this moment, it happened on, 20, on January 27th. A woman, the first woman terrorist, stood next to him with two suitcases. She blew herself up. She killed my father instantly. And I must admit that I couldn't walk through or drive through Jaffa Street for five years. I did it once by mistake, 
And when I stood on close to the place where my father was assassinated, I felt that my legs are trembling. It's like I said, I can't get back to this place. And this is not my home. It's like Jaffa Street, but it's the place that my father lost his life. And with this, I go now to 2024, thinking about those people who saw all those things in front of their eyes. I was not next to my father, who lost their beloved ones next to them in their kibbutz, in their shelter, in their heaven. And we are asking them to go back to those places and to stand in front of our camera and speak up. And for this, you need a lot of, a lot of courage. I think I'm not sure about myself if I would have done the same as they did, but they had this courage to sit in front of our cameras and to tell their stories and to look directly into the lens. And, and for that, I must thank them. I did it on shooting on the shooting days, but I thank them again and again for this courage. You, you also interviewed um, the idea of spokesperson Daniel Agari. Uh, who he himself said he's still living October 7th, 2023, today, a year later. Um, you also spoke about why he chose the name of this war, Iron Swords, and what his, his experience was on that day. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? We really thanked Hagari for letting us interview him because he never did anything like that from the beginning of the war. He didn't want to expose himself but on those nights when he stands in front of the camera and tells the people of Israel what's going on. And he really went into his own story, telling us what happened with his family when he had to leave them on this morning, very early morning of October 7th, drive to the headquarters of the army in Tel Aviv, thinking about what will be the name of this war, how can it connect to what happened before? And he gave it this name that you just mentioned. But then when he sits in front of our cameras, he says, I know now that this name has no meaning at all. It's October 7th war. This is the name of this war. That's the only way people will, will remember this day. I think the thing about Hagari is that Everyone should remember that this man was a very high officer in the army. He was a commander. He, and he's in a kind of a new job now that he got only a few months before the, before the war. And he talked a little bit about his frustration from not being able to fight, to do what he knows. That, that's what he did most of his life, to lead soldiers to the front. And in this case, he had to stand in front of cameras. But I think that saying so, he knows that his, his job and the way he did it is crucial for, for all of us who live here. Absolutely. I feel like it was every night when we would wait anxiously for Agari to take the stage on TV, and he was sort of the, the reassurance that, that we, the public, needed so badly in those moments that we knew. We didn't know anything of what was happening. We're a year later after this five-part uh, documentary series that you uh, created and directed. What are your conclusions after this experience, this year? First of all, I must bring another name to the, to the screen. He, his name is Amnon Rabi. He's my fellow creator of this uh, series. He's the head of Castina Productions, who is standing behind all this huge work. And he is the one who sat in front of all the people in, and made all the interviews. So I must give him the full credit for doing so. And regarding me and what I think about this year and about this horrific day that was exactly one year ago, I think that one of the most important themes of this series is hope. And when you hear sentences that are full of hope from the people who witnessed and lost their most beloved ones, when you hear those sentences from them, you say to yourself, okay, there is a lot of hope. 
for, for all of us. It doesn't matter how many videos have been seen and published by Hamas itself of those gruesome attacks that day. So many people around the world to this day still deny the atrocities of October 7th. Are there plans to translate the series to English so that the rest of the world can hear these testimonies firsthand? Absolutely, yes. Yes, and this, this point that you just mentioned is crucial for us as well, because I think that uh, showing, and we have a lot of Hamas clips within this series, it was very important for us to, sell, to show the joy of being evil. There is one shot which, can, which will never leave my memory. It's one of the first shots that I saw from this raw material that we got from Hamas of a terrorist that stands on, uh, on the front balcony of a very nice and modest um, home in one of the kibbutzim in Sufa. And he has a lighter in his hand. And while you hear the shooting around, he's standing and he starts to put on fire all the decorations of this small house, which probably belongs to old people. And you see the joy on his, on his, on his behavior, on his face, while lighting up this, the beautiful, this beautiful balcony. And you know, it's a minor act because he's not, actually at this moment, he's not hurting anyone, but you can see the way he enjoys it. And that, I, I remember seeing that, and that this picture will never leave me because it says so much with not going too graphic inside what the, th the things that happened there. And we all know that they happened all over the place, but it's crucial for us to show it, to show the face of, of evil. It, it seems almost pervasive to ask you, you know, as we move forward, because it seems almost impossible to move forward a year later when we're still experiencing war. And now we've got a seven front war with uh, Hamas and Gaza, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, Iraq, and now a, a ballistic missile, two ballistic missile attacks from Iran. And that war only seems uh, even closer to happening. Um, but when it comes to the shared um, trauma, the collective trauma that Israelis are experiencing still to this day, in your eyes, having spoken to so many Israelis who experienced this day firsthand, who survived this day, how do you move forward? I think that the spirit of this, I think that the spirit of hope and the spirit, spirit of strength, you can see them in every point of this series. You hear the story and then you hear what the guy who was interviewed or the woman is doing with it how his perspective about this place changed. And I think that when you see those people speaking one after the other, you understand how much hope we have and how strong we are. And this is one of the most important things for me in this series. Well, let's hope that those 101 uh, hostages that still remain in captivity come home very soon. Gilad Tukatli, thank you very much for joining me today. Most welcome. Thank you.